parents come to the ED scared or confused or intrigued about all of the weird things that kids do. I'm not so worried about a toddler who newly discovers he can outblink you or the preschooler who only eats orange foods on Tuesdays. I do perk up my ears when I hear a newborn or young infant doing something just out of the ordinary. You know, mom says he gets startled when she changes him. Okay, well, maybe that's a moral reflex. But that same child is now seven months old. Not so typical now. Or he just seems to move his lips like he's chewing on something. But mom had already long ago finished feeding, and he's two months old. Hmm. The neurologic exam of the newborn and young infant sometimes gets abbreviated to moving all extremities well, right? If we leave it at that, we're missing the mark. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Today, we'll go through the neurologic examination you know and love and tailor it to the pre-verbal child. Think of it this way. If you can master this version, one that is really based on careful observation, you'll have an even easier time when your patient can actually follow directions. We'll go through the general assessment, red flag physical findings, and then a focused exam of motor, sensory, and reflexes. Of course, you'll want to know as much as you can about the perinatal history, gestational age, any difficulties in labor, any asphyxia, all of that. When you're getting the history from the parents or caregivers, remember that your rapport with them will make a difference throughout the encounter. If you can really listen to them and understand where they're coming from, you'll get a deeper sense of what's really going on. But just as important, you can start to build trust. The calmer the caregiver, the calmer the child, which will help you to get a better exam. Take that moment to connect. Take a moment also to observe. Watch what the child is doing or not doing before you even start changing your exam by interacting with the newborn or young infant. What's his level of alertness? Is he in quiet sleep? That's when the newborn is still with deep, regular respirations. They're harder to wake from quiet sleep. Is he in active sleep? That's when the newborn may move or stir or make baby noises. Anything can wake up that child in active sleep. Is the child awake or drowsy? Is he alert? Is he crying? Of course, the best time to examine the infant is when he's quiet and awake and fed and happy. That's probably not when you're going to see him, but using a little bit of observation time and reassessment may get you the information you need to reassure yourself or to pull the trigger for a bigger investigation. An evidence-based level of consciousness for pre-verbal children is the AVPU score, A-V-P-U score, alert, verbal, painful and unresponsive. Is the child alert? Does he respond to verbal stimulus, to painful stimulus, or unresponsive? The P in AFPU corresponds to the threshold GCS of 8. While you're doing your general exam, you're actually doing the neuro exam. Remember, you're making note of every observation, trying to put it into context and seeing how the child reacts to your exam. Starting from the head, is it large? Is it small? Are there signs of trauma? You can measure an occipital frontal circumference 
and hopefully plot it against a previous measurement that's available. You can measure the head circumference by placing the tape at the bridge of the nose, under the ears, to the occipital protuberance. When you feel for the infant's fontanelles, ideally he's in an upright position, usually when the child is still in the mother or father's arms. If the child is sitting up, calm, not crying, and there's a bulging fontanelle, especially if he's less active, you have a good argument for increased intracranial pressure. Feel the scalp, and you can even auscultate the head. A faint venous hum is normal. But if you hear a sharp whoosh, whoosh, intense, soft whoosh, whoosh, this is an asymmetric systolic diastolic bruit. You shouldn't hear any bruits in the head, right? This may be a sign of an arteriovenous malformation involving the vein of Galen. Moving on to the spine. Of course, we're going to look for dimples or patches of hair that may be a sign of a neural tube defect. Maybe you see a hypopigmented skin oval patch on the back and think, hmm, ash leaf spot, tuberous sclerosis. Chagrin patches are the lumpy bumpy ruddy patches. Maybe there's a facial hemangioma, especially involving branches of the trigeminal nerve, and that could be Sturge-Weber syndrome, another sign of a possible AVM. Okay, we're moving from the general now to the specific. Let's check motor function. We can take note of the child's tone and even elicit certain reflexes, looking for their appropriate presence or absence and symmetry. Again, we're observing carefully, using this as a screening exam. Newborns who are born at term should have a normally flexed posture. They should look like little baby boxers ready for a fight. They should be active and move extremities equally. Hypotonia can be seen in a variety of conditions. As an example, it's normal and expected in Down syndrome. But what we're looking for here in the ED is a change, an unexpected finding that may point to the reason for the chief complaint. A hypotonic infant just lies there. Instead of a normal flexed tone where the infant looks like he's ready to jump into the boxing ring, the hypotonic infant lies with arms flat on the bed, extended and hips splayed out in a frog leg position. This is not normal. There may be a marked head lag. You lift the child gently from the bed by his arms and his neck just doesn't show any effort. There's no tone there. You can also check for vertical suspension. If you hold the child upright at the chest and the shoulder girdle muscles have decreased tone, the infant seems to slip through your hands. The ventral suspension test is when you hold the child belly down and the legs and arms just dangle there. There's no tone to speak of. Hypotonia is, of course, a whole other discussion with a wide differential diagnosis, but in short, if you see it, you just don't ignore it. Hypertonia often presents with spasticity. These are rigid little lead pipes. This differential is also broad, but think about new things like meningitis or stroke. Let's talk reflexes, the deep tendon reflexes, and the developmental reflexes. The traditional deep tendon reflexes are hard to elicit in newborns, but it's possible. We do them to test the continuity of the arc between the central and peripheral nervous systems. I say this with a caveat because if the child is otherwise well, with normal tone and a normal flexed newborn posture, the absence of a reflex may not be that helpful, so just use them as only a part of the whole picture. But here are a few that you can try. The jaw. You can tap on the chin with the baby's mouth slightly open. 
it'll close shut. The biceps. You can test if you can really bench, bro. I put the tip of my thumb over the antecubital fossa and tap briskly but gently. That will give you flexion at the elbow. The brachial radialis. I use the index finger over the distal end of the muscle belly, just proximal to the wrist, to tap, and you'll get a slight flexion at the elbow. The patellar reflex. Same technique, you get slight extension to the knee. And of course, we're looking for symmetry here with the deep tendon reflexes. So to me, these aren't as reliable in newborns and infants as the famous developmental reflexes. The developmental reflexes are not really reflex arcs like deep tendon reflexes. They're primitive but complex autonomic movements that are mediated by the brainstem. When we elicit them, we're looking for the appropriate presence or absence. Now, they should all be present at birth. Again, we give a little bit of leeway to the premature babies. As the brain and spinal cord mature, inhibitory projections from the cerebral cortex to the subcortical motor nuclei will mature, and these will cause the developmental reflexes to extinguish gradually over time. So they're abnormal if, one, they're absent when they should be there, two, they're persistent when they shouldn't be there or they should have extinguished, or three, if they're asymmetric. In general, if you had to remember a rule of thumb, all of them should be present at birth and most of these should be absent by age four to six months. There are a few exceptions, mostly those concerning the feet only. The upper extremity developmental reflexes tend to extinguish faster than the lower extremity reflexes, mostly because newborns and young infants tend to interact with the world more with their upper body than their lower body at this age, and the maturation of deliberate motor pathways is accelerated. So with that in mind, we'll go from top to bottom. Rooting, sucking, moro, palmer grasp, fencing, then foot grasp, babinski, stepping, placing, and gallant. There are actually many, many more, but these are the most relevant to us in the acute setting. The sucking reflex is when you place your gloved finger at the roof of the baby's mouth, even at the lips, and the child will begin to suck. This is extinguished at four to six months. The rooting reflex happens when you touch the, she the cheek or the angle of the mouth and the baby turns towards you. You can test both sides to see if his general motor is intact. This is extinguished at four to six months as well. The moral reflex is elicited when the child is startled, and this could be a loud sound or a sudden feeling of falling or lack of support. You can do this most easily by extending the child's arms and then letting go quickly. All four limbs will abduct, extend, then relax and adduct and flex back. The most reliable, studied, and reproducible way to elicit the reflex is to cradle the child's neck in one hand and the head in the other and carefully allow the head to dip in relation to the body. It gives the baby a sense of falling. Remember, we're also looking for symmetry in the response. The palmer grasp reflex occurs when you place a finger in the child's palm and he holds on. No, oh, new friend. Again, check for symmetry in grasp and hold. Like all of the others, it'll extinguish about four to six months of age. The fencing reflex is a showstopper. It's also called the asymmetric tonic neck reflex. Let's just go with fencing. It's easier to remember what happens when you turn the child's head gently to one side and hold it there for at least... 15 seconds. The baby will look like a little fencing student. You turn his head to the right and he will extend his right arm and his right leg. The left arm and left leg will flex slightly. You can try that on both sides to look for an equal response. So those were the upper extremity developmental reflexes that all tend to extinguish at four to six months. Moving on to the lower portion of the body, the gallant reflex is also called the truncal incurvation reflex. You hold the baby face down, 
cradling him in your forearm, and then you stroke down along each paraspinal ridge from the thorax down to the lumbar spine. When you stroke the right paraspinal ridge down, the baby's trunk and hips will curve to the right. When you stroke down the left, the hips don't lie and curve out to the left. The gallant reflex extinguishes also at four to six months. The lower extremity reflexes vary when they're extinguished, but a good rule of thumb that is if you are testing the feet only, that'll stick around to about a year or so. The plantar reflex on the sole of the foot is basically the same as the palmar grasp. You place your thumb on the forefoot of the sole just under the toes and they will flex down into your thumb and hold. This will disappear later at 12 to 15 months. The Babinski reflex, remember, is the opposite in adults and children. They're elicited the same, but the response is the opposite. In an adult, when you stroke the sole of the foot from the lateral side, looping up to the first metatarsal, again in adults, you'll either get nothing or a downward curling of the toes, normal in adults. In children, when you do this, a normal response is that their toes will curl up. Remember, the inhibitory pathways are still forming. So adults down, children up. The upward Babinski in children extinguishes between one to two years of age. The stepping reflex is a fun one. You hold the baby upright and bring him down so that his feet touch the gurney. He'll start to step. He'll alternate one foot, raising it, then the other. This will extinguish pretty early, about two to four months of age. Remember, it involves a whole leg and thigh and trunk, so it belongs to the others that extinguish earlier. The placing reflex is sort of a variation of the stepping reflex. You hold the baby up like in a stepping reflex, but at this time you gently touch the dorsum of his foot to a surface. Like the edge of a bed, you can lift that little leg up. This one will extinguish later at one year of age. Again, we're just testing the foot, let's just say, so it extinguishes later. So all of the developmental reflexes extinguish between four to six months, the moro, the gallant, the grasp. The exceptions are those that test the feet, mostly the plantar reflex, the babinski, and the placing. There's usually about age one, one to two. When in doubt, look it up. The most important thing is to ask yourself, is it normal that he or she still has this developmental reflex? Or wait, she is so little, why is it not there? Like anything on the neuro exam, it's always abnormal to be asymmetrical. Let's go over the cranial nerves. Oh, you didn't think we could test cranial nerves in babies? We sure can. We'll modify, but we can get there. Now, of course, we're not going to do this on all newborns and infants, but the more offbeat or odd the chief complaint, especially if the caregiver is having a hard time describing exactly what was off, maybe it's just hard to describe weird observations, that's the more that I want to focus on this neuro exam and break it down. Cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve. Well, that's our first fail. We don't have a great way to test this in preverbal children, and you know what? That's okay. There is literature supporting the use of concentrated peppermint extract to either get a startle response or a sucking response. If you were pressed, you could use the clove oil that's in your tooth kit to test cranial nerve one. Cranial nerve two, the optic nerve. You're looking to see if the baby will blink to light. Very premature babies born at 26 weeks conceptual age will blink to light. At 32 weeks, the baby can fixate on an object and full-term babies will turn their heads to a soft light. Cranial nerve three is your oculomotor nerve. It powers one of the cardinal movements of the eye. And remember, if you shine a light and get pupillary constriction, then cranial nerves two and three are working. The pupillary response is consistently present in term babies. The other cranial nerves responsible for extraocular movements can be observed during the course of the evaluation. So we're talking cranial nerves three, oculomotor, four, trochlear, six, abducens. 
You can change sides of the gurney, use a soft light for the baby to look at, get him to look at his mother from different positions, all to see if he's moving both eyes in all directions. Be creative and flexible, but be persistent. You can also check cranial nerves three, four, and six by doing the doll's eye maneuver, also called the oculocephalic reflex. Of course, we won't even try to do this if there's any head or neck trauma in case of a cervical spine injury. In an otherwise normal infant, we can see whether or not the extraocular muscles are working, and for that matter, whether the brainstem is intact, since this is part of the brain death exam. Anyway, in the right context, if need be, you have the child lying on the gurney, head is midline. Keep the eyelids open, hold them open, and quickly turn the head to one side. A normal response is when the patient will try to fixate on the midline. Since you're turning the head, the extraocular muscles are working to move the eyeballs in the opposite direction. So to us, it just looks like the eyes are fixated on the midline. Bring the head back to the midline, wait a moment, and do the other side. Just to add a little more to chew on, when you're doing the doll's eye test in a child that you're concerned about, you may see a number of abnormalities that could direct you to the cause of the child's neurologic injury or condition. If you see spontaneous, horizontal, unidirectional, jerky eye movements, this could be a sign of a frontal lobe seizure. If the eyes are fixated downward, this could be a sign of increased intracranial pressure, the so-called sunset eyes. If the eyes appear to be at different horizontal planes, a skew eye deviation, there may be a metabolic brainstem poisoning or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. We can test cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, by touching the face with tissue paper or a cotton swab. If necessary, again, only when you need to know, you can touch the cotton tip to the cornea to elicit a blink response. Cranial nerve 6, the abducens, we just talked about with our other extraocular movements. Cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, if the newborn or infant is able to close both eyelids when he or she is crying, you're good. But if you see asymmetry in crying or if you see excessive drooling on one side, that may be a sign of facial nerve weakness. It's just another example of it's all in the observation. Cranial nerve 8, the vestibulocochlear nerve. You can test this if the infant blinks or startles to a loud noise. Cranial nerve 8 is intact even in premature babies. Cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, can be observed with normal swallowing and phonation. Cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, is just not usually tested in babies. We just don't have a good way to get them to shrug their shoulders on command. And then cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve, can be observed with normal tongue movements when the baby juts his tongue out or is about to feed. So bringing this all together, you walk in, you flash a light, the pupils react. So cranial nerve two, optic, cranial nerve three, oculomotor intact. You observe the child fixating on his mother and maybe he or she tracks you from either side or you can even be more hands-on if you need to with the doll's eye maneuver. If the gaze stays midline, then cranial nerve three, oculomotor, four, trochlear, and six, abducens, all intact. A loud clap startles him. Cranial nerve 8, vestibulocochlear, intact. He cries, eyelids close, cranial nerve 7, facial intact. You feed him normally, and remember that his feeding, sucking, swallowing all are mediated by 5 trigeminal, 7 facial, 9 glossopharyngeal, 10 vagus, and 12 hypoglossal. So, shine a light, clap your hands, get him to cry, get him to feed. You've pretty much done a good cranial nerve exam because you know what to look for and how to look for it. In summary, when we're talking about the neurologic exam of the newborn and infant, you're doing it subconsciously all the time. 
observation and truly being present when observing. This is the key to being methodical and noticing which nerves and arcs are working properly and which are not. Gather as much information as you can during your routine exam. It can be so rich and satisfying to observe what you see and break down what exactly is obviously intact and what may need special maneuvers or consultation. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.